So hi there, uh, Mr. Finley here, and we're going to talk a little bit about what the Greek theater looked like, because it looked pretty different from what we would imagine a play today might look like. Today when you go in, you sit in seats, and there's a big red curtain in front of you, and a big square arch, and then that curtain goes up, and then you watch the show. Or maybe you go to a movie, where instead of the big square arch, there's a big flat screen. The Greek theater, because of course it existed thousands of years ago, about 2,500 years ago, in fact, looked really different. We talked in the last video about where it came from, from uh, the festival of Dionysus, and the chorus, and Thespis, and all that. But this is sort of where it was done. It was done in what was called an amphitheater. An amphitheater is a big outdoor theater in which the seats, these are seats, I'm, I know, I'm a horrible artist, but the seats are in a big sort of semicircle. In the biggest of them, uh, like at Ephesus, which is a place uh, in Greece, they're actually carved into the side of a mountain. So you could seat thousands of people in all of these seats. And of course, it's outdoors because we need some sunlight. We can't just bring everyone inside. It would be too dark. This is 25 hundred years ago. We don't have electric lights. The seats are in this sort of semicircle around a big round place that was called the orchestra, which literally means the dancing place or the place of the chorus. This is where, I'll find my marker, this is where the chorus would go. And it was this large circular area to give them plenty of time to dance. Uh, play the space to dance, I'm sorry. Uh, because in, as well as performing the role of whether the townspeople or another army, whoever the chorus was playing, they were also dancing and singing. This, by the way, if you're interested in musical theater, we still use the word chorus, uh, except it means the group of people who sing and dance uh, sort of in the background of a musical. So we still use that word. We also still use the word orchestra but it's come to mean a group of musicians because, of course, back then there would also be musicians surrounding this orchestra as well. There would also be a sort of flat, raised platform here, sort of like the, we would have the stage today. They would call this the skene, um, which is very close, if you notice, to our word scene. You replace the K with C and you've got scene. And it's the same root that we get the word scenery, um, or, if you've been in my drama class, proscenium, that big square arch that was on your vocabulary test, well, that comes from this, pro meaning in front of, proscenium, before the skene. Um, anyway, so those are the three parts of the Greek amphitheater, where these plays would be performed. The seating in the semicircle, the round chorus, and then the raised platform or skene where the actors would be. Usually there was a wall behind it um, that was painted with scenery and there would be three doors in that to make entrances out of as the different characters. Now, it looked a bit different. First of all, uh, as you can guess, there was no lighting effects because we were doing it outside. Um, and of course they didn't have uh, things that we might have like recorded sound or microphone, but they did have some technologies that they used. First of all, all the plays were performed in masks, and these masks were quite large. This was so that even if you were sitting way back here in the last row, which might be halfway up the mountainside in one of these really big mountain amphitheaters, you could still see the characters uh, all the way down on the stage. Um, you could tell, oh, that is clearly Agamemnon, or oh, that is clearly Yocasta, because they're wearing that mask, and I can see it all the way back here. Um, also, very clever, built into the masks were megaphones, uh, because of course they didn't have microphones back then. And while the acoustics of the amphitheater were really good, and they helped sound carry up to the last seat, it was also good to have a little bit of amplification. So those big masks served two purposes. One was to make sure that the people in the very back row could see who we were playing, um, and also because they had that built-in megaphone uh, to help sound carry. But there was another purpose for those masks as well, and this is kind of important. Again, these stories came from Greek myths that those people would already have known, and the characters in these stories were gods and heroes. 
And in uh, the Greek world, the line between heroes and gods was very, very blurry. Um, in fact, sometimes we refer to them as demigods, these people who were born mortal, but in some ways were closer to the gods anyway. So it makes sense for them to be a little bit larger than life. So again, it makes sense for them to have these masks that make them appear larger than life. The other thing they did to help them appear larger than life were these things called cathurni. I love this. Cathurni were these shoes that had like six inch or maybe even one foot uh, um, soles on them. So they were sort of like miniature stilts or really tall platform shoes. Um, and the actors would wear these and would make them seem bigger than normal people. Not only would that help them be seen all the way at the back of the amphitheater, but it would also make them feel larger than life. Because after all, the point of going to the theater in uh, the Greek world wasn't just to have a good time. No, it was to be transformed. And the thing that transformed you was spending time with gods and heroes. Uh, and so it made sense to try and make these gods and heroes on stage look larger than life with those large masks and the cathurni that lifted them up. Another thing that makes Greek plays different from a play that you might see today are what we call the unities. Uh, there was this guy by the name of Aristotle. Maybe you've heard of him. He wrote a lot about a lot of different things, but he wrote a book called The Poetics in which he talked about all the plays he'd seen and what made them work. And he noticed in most of them that worked, um, there were what we called unities, and there were three of them. Unity of time, unity of place, and unity of action. Unity of time just meant that the play takes place basically in real time. What Aristotle actually says was that it should take place in 24 hours. That means we're not doing uh, jumps to the future or jumps to the past. There aren't like flashbacks or anything like that. But rather, the play takes place in real time. Unity of place just means that there's one location. We're not all over the place. We don't have a scene here and a scene there. But instead, everything takes place in one location. And unity of action means that there is one main plot. We don't have tons of different subplots going on. Now, we've seen these unities broken um, tons, and basically every movie we've ever seen breaks all three of these unities. Because in a movie, you can go instantly from place to place, or from time to time, or you can have multiple subplots and cut back and forth between them. But remember, a play is not a movie. So in a play, if we go from place to place, we've got to do a set change, and that's going to slow the whole thing down. If we have to do multiple subplots, we've got to uh, switch from plot to plot, and it's going to slow us down. So in most Greek plays, um, they held to Aristotle's unities, which means there's going to be uh, one time, basically the play takes place in real time, it's going to take place in one location, so not, so lo not lots of different sets. And there's going to be one main plot. Um, it makes it a little easier to follow and also concentrates the action. So that may seem a little bit unusual, because we're used to movies with lots of plots and lots of locations, going back and forth in time. But because this works so well on stage, most of the Greek plays hold to those unities that Aristotle observed. So anyway, those are some of the big differences between a Greek play and a play that you might see today. There's one more thing I want to mention, and that is the plays were not done in everyday speech, but they were done in a sort of poetry. Remember from the last video that these were um, a sort of religious experience. They came out of the festival of Dionysus, and we're talking about gods and heroes here. And it makes sense that gods and heroes shouldn't speak in everyday language. So when you read a Greek play, you're going to notice that usually the way it's laid out on the page and also the way it sounds, it's going to sound a little weird and look a little weird on the page. That's because it's poetry. It's not that if we went back 2,500 years and walked around Greece that that's the way everyone spoke. No. That's the way they wanted to think of their heroes and their gods as speaking. So when we read these plays, it's going to be in a sort of poetry, because it makes more sense for gods and heroes to speak in poetry than just everyday vernacular language, to use that word from our, uh, our vocabulary a couple weeks ago. Anyway, so unities, poetry, some things like masks and cathurni, and an amphitheater. Uh, with a circle of seating, a chorus, uh, I'm sorry, an orchestra for the chorus, and a skene, 
uh, in which the uh, actors perform. So, things that make uh, Greek theater different. Thanks.